Now we're going to talk about um, building these models for these systems and how we're going to use this information, okay? And to be sure we are all on the same page, I'm going to set a little bit of language here. I'm pretty sure you know this, but it's just to make sure we all talk in the same language. So when we say we're going to interpolate some data, what we're actually saying is that we're going to go through the data points. We are not saying we're going to use this function to guess points in between, which is what most people usually mean by interpolation. What we are saying is, whatever you do with this function, this function goes through the points. That's what interpolation means. Interpolation is contrary to smoothing or approximation. Okay? It's not contrary to extrapolation. As you see here, I have an interpolant and use it to extrapolate. Usually bad idea, but you could do it. You can use your interpolant to predict values outside the range of observed data. And that's extrapolation. So you can use an interpolation for to do extrapolation. And people find this confusing. It's basically because the words are not very cleverly chosen. Um, so I invented a word to make it it's called interpolation, which is the opposite of extrapolation. And interpolation means is whatever you have at hand, either an interpolating or a smoothing model, you're going to use it to guess values within the data point, so in the domain of the observed things. Uh, and if you want to use extrapolate, you're going to be outside of that domain. Inside and outside, in high dimensional space, I guess you also know, it's very hard to define. But, you know, in the line, people believe they know uh, what inside and outside is. But uh, it's an ill-defined concept. But anyways, just to make clear, so interpolation is the opposite to smoothing or approximating. Interpolation is the opposite to extrapolation. Okay. <clears throat> And then we're going to be talking about regression. I already mentioned it. You know this. I'm just going to go fast here, but please do stop me. Um, so the regression problem is going to define an hypothesis set, usually functions, but it could be a value also. Um, and then we have some data set, some you know, input, output data. So this will be supervised uh, methods when we're going to talking about. Um, and then we define some loss function. Usually, for most of our methods, we'll ask this loss function is convex, but it could be non-convex. Um, and then what it does to our hypothesis set, it kind of puts a gradient on it, and we are going to find either a minima or a maxima so of those things. So that's essentially regression, right? <coughs> um, just seen like that, and if this loss function is actually a fit, uh, a quality of fit value, what you're going to end up here, that f hat is an interpolant. But it depends on the relation between your model and your data, whether it will be an interpolant or a smoothing thing. But the point here is that there is no other thing but the loss function, which is a function of your data, your model evaluated in your data, in your inputs, and the data you have, and maybe some parameters. Okay. Then we have constrained regression problems in which we want the same thing as before, but now we add constraints. That means we have some rel mathematical relations which need to be fulfilled exactly by the solution you provide. In this case, because it's going to be relevant, so the usual setup will be like this. So we have some functions, algebraic functions, um, or functionals, I will say, that evaluate only on your model. So the, you see here I'm not using the data. It's only a property. We are talking about properties of your model. And maybe some inequality constraints on your model, right? And then in the space, besides now your gradient, what you have now is these lines. You know, this will be the G line, the, the equality constraints. This could be the inequality constraints region. And now you want to find something that minimizes so that it's as blue as possible, but within the yellow region and on top of the G line, right? That's constraint regression. You see, unless you're very lucky, you will not be close to the minima at all here. But you know that whatever you got fulfills this relationship. Now, I add here that you may also have a differential operator on your um, things, which is not an algebraic equation anymore. And you also want that, this that your solution is in the null space or in the nullity of this differential operator. Um, so here, this will be give again another set of functions that will intersect with this one. But here, I just put it like some uh, level curves. But it is that this not just a line, but multiple lines or even a whole set of, of functions. Um, and again, you want your function to be also there, so you need to find the intersection between your constraints and your dynamics. This usually, if you work with differential equations, this is basically what you're saying is from the analytical solution of your differential equation, you want, for example, something that fulfills the boundary conditions, right? 
So that's G H rela G D relation there, but it could be more general. Um, okay. Then you have regularized regression, in which instead of having exactly fulfilled relationships, we just penalize those terms. So here the conceptual step is, this is subject to or such that, that means exactly this. So when I get my model, I evaluate all these things. I want to get zero or you know EPS if you are doing numerical, EPS, and then so epsilon of the machine, epsilon of the machine, and here actually a negative value or again EPS. Um, while here, we're just penalizing this guy. So when I evaluate this, I may get completely different to zero. This may be completely different, and this uh, will be maybe positive, but a small number positive. Just penalizing, right? Um, these two problems are very different, and these ones tend to be easier than the other ones. Sometimes, depends. Uh, sometimes the other ones are easy, but in general, I would say these ones are easier. But they don't provide points probably anymore. Now you will get like regions of solutions that have the same performance. So for given k, for given these weights on the things, you may get many solutions that uh, are equally equivalent. Okay. I know I'm saying all things here. I'm sorry, but uh, yeah, we need to go through this to make sure we don't. Okay. Then you have regular and constrained regression problems in which some of the things, some of the qualities here, you prefer to penalize them, but the others you may still conserve as a quality constraint. Okay. And then, and this could be, you know, I just choose here the differential operation, which is a common scenario, but uh, it could be any of the other. <coughs> okay. So now we go to the topic. I'm sorry it took half or more than half of the presentation to get here. But um, so how are all these things connected? This is what I'm trying to show here. I want to show you kind of a unification of all these things. So if I say, OK, I want to do regularized regression, the classical nonlinear regularized regression, something related with dif linear differential operators, so linear is important here, Gaussian process, and Kalman filters. So who immediately says, like, these are all equivalent? You know that. Very good. And if I put this, only this slide, and say, look, look, these things are all the same. Like, would you complain? Like, wow, 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 this is not. You know these are actually all the same? OK, very good. If you don't know, then this, I'm giving you something. <clears throat> so the problem of regular regression, we already mentioned it. We want input-output values. Uh, we want to approximate the data and get good predictions. So we're going to get some kind of extrapolation operation or uh, out of sample error uh, as a measure of it and um, we're going to impose something like that where r is now a linear differential operator so the dynamical constraint here is a linear differential operator on f c again these terms does not use the data it's something you say about f so it's your prior knowledge on f okay, before you saw the data um, and in words it means that my solution should be close to the data but should be regular according to R. So you should not have a norm there that is too big. OK? Again, typical example, we get a, a polynomial regression for n points with n degree. We can overfit, we can completely uh, interpolate these values. But if I penalize by this differential operator, the second derivative, the more I penalize, the closer I get to a straight line. So although I'm using a very high order or a very high degree polynomial, if I penalize a lot, I basically tell this guy why well, your second derivative should be zero, so you're going to be aligned. And, um, but in, you may get intermediate results, right? Like things uh, that are a uh, high order but still minimize the second derivative. Okay? Um, so these are technical. I'm going to go maybe slower here, but the trick to get the results is that from this problem, you write it in a functional form. Maybe you're familiar with this step already. So you use the delta here to write this discrete thing as a continuous stuff. Then you arrange terms, and then you realize that your solution is the green function of this operator here. This is the adjoint operator. Okay? So the solution is the green function to this guy. So if you know the green function of your uh, differential operator, you know what f should be, and then you can use it to minimize your problem. So what I'm saying here is like this problem has an analytical solution. Okay. This is how you 
so nonlinear still convex uh, regression problems with linear operators as uh, regularizers. They can be analytically solved, provided you can compute these and solve for the green function. When you solve that thing that we got there, what you get is that your model is essentially has this structure here. Right? That's that's the general solution of the uh, regularized regression problem where the regularizer is a linear differential operator. Okay. Did anybody recognizes this structure here? Huh? No? So that's the mean value of a Gaussian process, which is, okay, here I describe what a Gaussian process is. I'm going to mention, I'm not going to go into this, it is completely necessary, but then if you put the two things one to one, what you see, you know, one to one, them thing. Now let's put a little bit of meaning here. This G is a green function, it represents the inverse of a linear differential operator. The mean value is given by the null space of the differential operator. So all the functions that you're regularizer does not penalize should be part of your solution. So we remove it from our data and then we add it back. Okay. In a Gaussian process basic what you could say is that the mean is never in the reproducing kernel space of the Gaussian process because it's exactly what you hear. Because this kernel is not able to generate the mean, you get it out from your data you do your regression problem over the re in the residuals, and then you put back what you took out, right? That's the role of your mean function. So if you know, again, that you have a problem in which your mean function does not belong to any uh, R, uh, R -A -K -H -S, is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> um, then you need to put a non-zero mean Gaussian process, okay? And uh, But you can also interpret it immediately as that up there. So here... This is just, let's say the mean seems to be correlated one to one. So whatever you predict with the Gaussian process will be the same as doing some um, regularized regression, in this case uh, um, with a uh, mean squares, least squares, error, um, with a given differential operator uh, as a regularizer. A typical example, if you have a linear ODE, you know, that has, is a linear differential operator with some inputs, uh, gives you some noise, then, and the noise is Gaussian, then the solution of your differential equation, so all the um, gray lines there are actual solutions of the stochastic differential equation. So we are saying, like, there is a, a spring or a particle moving, uh, you know, it could be actuated, so it could be a rocket or something like that, but the environment is putting noise on, you know, the velocity, is putting forces, random forces on it. So all the things here that you get here are actually valid solutions of that dynamics. Uh, they are not perturbed solutions. They are actually solutions. And this is the mean solution to all that problem, um, which corresponds to uh, the actual uh, non-stochastic problem. <coughs> This immediately, if you do the, uh, let's say, if you transform it as a Gaussian process, you're going to obtain a non-stationary covariance function. Looks like that for the first order differential equation I'm using there. And your predictions will be basically, um, the black line is the realization of the stochastic differential op uh, operator, that uh, differential equation that generated the red dots, which are the data. And then I'm interpolating with this Gaussian process. It's wrong because I know there is a stochasticity there, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to interpolate. I get the green thing as the uh, prediction with some errors that are very reasonable in this case because I know what they are. And then here to stress again this idea of the prior. Let's say some guy comes, doesn't know anything about what I say, just say, right? Get the same data and say, well, you know, Gaussian process means square exponential covariance. Everybody knows that, right? Somehow that's what people understand. Uh, and he does the same thing with a square exponential covariance function. So, okay, yeah, he got an interpolant. Look at the confidence intervals of that interpolant. Like the square exponential kernel is super confident of the exactly wrong solution. 
right? So not having the right prior could lead you into that. You don't use your prior information, you get bullocks. Uh, Steinken and Schokolf, they kind of went back to the history of all these equivalences and actually made a simplifying relation between all these things. What I just illustrated here was uh, we start with a regularization operator. We somehow compute a covariance operator to this method, the green function method, and then we can build a Gaussian process out of that. Um, but of course, you have another axis where you can uh, make the interpretation. Interestingly here, the going back, so if I choose a covariance function, can I always find uh, a regularizer operator, which is one to one? Not always, you know, it's a square root there going there. Not every operator will accept a square root. So, um, yeah, it's not impossible, but you have to put more machinery in place there. Uh, <coughs> so there will be semi-definite kernels. Um, So if you want to read like the details of all these equivalences, you can go there. Um, and in this paper, they presented this result, which is a pendulum. Again, a pendulum where you have noise. So there are some random forces of so molecules that say are hitting this pendulum and moving it randomly. Um, so you observe some uh, trajectory, some data here, the, the x's. And then they do this computation that uh, there for a discrete version of the system, so it doesn't matter details. But they get this, and they make the same p comparison that I did before for the first, this is a second order equation, and they show the same thing. If you use what, let's say, the many people believe is a, the meaning of Gaussian process is a square exponential, I still don't know why people do that, because every single book I read says Gaussian processes can be like any covariance function, but people still say like, Gaussian process is the same as square ex a exponential covariance function. Um, so if you use that, it will be the first choice of many practitioners. Uh, they will get super confident about something that is completely wrong. Um, <coughs> and then they make this interesting comparison. They say, look, if we compare with a Kalman smoother, Kalman filter, we get exactly the same solution down to the machine precision. Like these two guys are predicting the same thing. Uh-huh. Maybe there is a link there. Kalman filters. Who is not familiar with Kalman filters? Raise your hand, please. Okay, we're going to go quickly through it. So Kalman filters is mechanistic modeling, okay? You start and say, look, I have some internal state of my system that I may or may not be observing that follows a linear differential equation. So this is an ODE. You say the change of those states in time will follow uh, relation like this. This is the state space matrix. It tells you how the derivative is computed from the states. This is the input matrix, so how some external inputs are affecting these derivatives, and there is some noise on it. <coughs> and then you're going to observe this system. So you're going to have an operator that takes measurements out of that, and usually expressed like that. So if H is a projection operator, you are just picking up one of these states. Okay? So you can think of a hidden Markov uh, chains. But if this is not a, no, uh, a projection, if it's another operator, you know, your observations are mixed of those states. For example, if I'm measuring here uh, with a microphone and you are speaking, right, the microphone will mix up your, your signals. So your speeches will be given by the axis, and my observation will be this mix of your things given by, by H. So H is the mixing matrix in that case. But the, op the inputs could directly, you know, affect that thing. For example, I'm telling, like, say, a mother in your nat natural language, that would be the input, it will be recorded as well, so I will put it here, and of course all your answers in your language will be mixed up by the microphone. Okay, that's just a scenario. And there will be also sensor noise there. So that's the a scenario that a uh, common filter starts with, and say, okay, how we can uh, make predictions and update this model iteratively. Okay, so uh, in an online an online algorithm. I'm not looking like for a global algorithm, but an online thing. And in many years of development, many, many, many years of years, you can do that. And if you use this particular flavor that I'm describing here, uh, this is the standard Kalman filter. These guys are Gaussian noises. If they are non-Gaussian, you fall into extensions of this method, external Kalman filter, uncentered Kalman filter. 
etc. They also can uh, include that these matrices are time dependent and even some sort of nonlinearities. Okay. The structure of the method is you start with some guesses of all these matrices and stuff, so your internal states and their uh, covariances. You go to a state update in which you simulate forward with this model I just gave you, you predict a new state, and also you propagate the covariance of those states with your model, right? with this the differential equation. If you now pick up a measurement, you move, so and you do that while well, there is no measurement, so you're just predicting based on your, you know, your prior information. Now comes a measurement, and then what you're going to do is you're going to obtain, uh, we're going to update your internal state. You're going to move your external state a little bit closer to the data, essentially. Uh, this is done by the Kalman gain. And um, <coughs> you're also going to update the estimation of the covariance. So usually the covariance close to a data point will be very small. Um, and then once you are done with your measurements, you will keep propagating the thing. The results you obtain is exactly what you get from a Gaussian process because they are the same thing. And O'Hagan had this very old paper on when he just basically describes a, an iterative method to do, uh, I think, spline fitting to a data generated by differential equations. And um, he wrote this paper, which is, you know, it's a standard application purpose, a useful, useful thing. Nowadays, not novel anymore. But now it's been republished with all the review process, and that's where the you know cake is in the review process because you get. Luckily, this guy was reviewed by like, Wava, um, uh, Bill, you know all the big guys in, in regression and all this iterative method Wava in particular, and what they say in him all the time is like whatever you are doing here, you are reinventing Kalman filtering, but O'Hagan started with a Gaussian process statement of the problem. Right, so and in the reviews, basically, say other reviewers mentioned the affinity between my results and the Kalman filter, and basically, he says, "Well, I, w I was not saying that my method is novel. I'm just saying like rewriting a standard method." But here is the important thing: is that this equivalence was already mathematically stated on a field that was extremely mathematical, right? Functional analysis, essentially. So statisticians could not read this work. It's like super heavy stuff. So what he's calling here is like, we could avoid duplication, if you're saying my results are ready, if you could translate your language to something that everybody can read, not just you. I think there is a message here that we are suffering the same thing nowadays. Like, there is this mismatch, this thing like, for example, people, when you say Gaussian processes, they think it should be the Gaussian, you know, covariance function, the square exponent. I think this is a problem because they actually don't understand what you're saying. As if you are probably of machine learning people, the practitioners are failing to understand your messages. So uh, one should be try to write more for also for the practitioners or for the people that are going to use your method, not only your peers, but also the people who are going to use your method or could use your method. Um, just, you know, like... It's interesting that this thing was there. Uh, this is 1978. Probably the unification was done like in 1968, so 10 years before that, and probably even earlier. But we are rediscovering it now because there is a huge fuss about guys who clearly say, look, look, look this we all know. It's nothing new what we are saying, but we're going to present to you algorithms that you actually can use to map between common filters and Gaussian processes Back and forth. Right? And this is this guy mainly nowadays, uh, Simon Sarka and Arno Solin. They are uh, from Alto University and they're heavily working on this, like this equivalence. Let's exploit it, let's develop algorithms, packages to do this uh, efficiently. Um, and in a very recent paper, they, by this equivalence, they managed to extend to create a new type of Kalman filter, okay? um, just by exploiting this relationship between Gaussian processes and a common filter. Um, why is it this thing? So if I ask you, without any approximation, if I have n data points, what's the um, complexity of uh, the Gaussian process uh, method? n cube. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, 
<coughs> so this big N will be here, T is the number of samples in time for the uh, Kalman filter. So the Kalman filter has this complexity. It's linear in the number of samples you have, but it has a ex slightly you know, higher coefficient given by the size of the internal states you are using. So, but now we are saying, look, if I think on the problem in terms of Gaussian processes, I pay T cube will be here a price. But if I look at it as a um, Kalman filter, it's linear in time. Uh -huh. So for the inference part, if I can map it, Gaussian process to a Kalman filter, I would do Kalman filter. But in the prediction step, it becomes the opposite. Like, Kalman like Gaussian process matrix and vector multiplication is like super trivial. It's much cheaper than these guys. Um, so you will use maybe your Gaussian process representation for the prediction step. So if you can go back and forth efficiently, you will get best of, all, of both algorithms. And um, this is what these guys are using. Okay, this is what I'm trying to fair this thing. <coughs> <coughs> the map again is one to one, provided. So this works when you have linear differential operators. Um, your um, covariance functions are stationary. Important point there. And uh, you have a convex loss function, then these things are one to one equivalent. Okay, if you violate some of the things, you may be able to go in one direction and not in the other. Okay. But if you have these three things, so if you are doing so this here means like standard scenario for Gaussian process regression, standard scenario for Galman filtering. That means that for all these standard things, you can go back and forth, no problem at all, and exploit the different things that these views on the problem give you, like going from Gaussian process to Kalman filter, uh, this inference in linear time of number of samples, um, regularized regression to Gaussian processes, well, now you can extend your models to be non-parametric. Now you are knowing that something is non-parametric anymore, so there's also a power there to understand. Um, and the conclusion here is that if your prior information about the process generating your data is linear, then you can merge this with most or with very popular machine learning methods. There are still many technical challenges here. And I have exhausted the time for my presentation, but the question that this, all this begets the question of, okay, what happens when we have nonlinear operators, which is what I've been describing. I'm gonna close here we're going to leave this because it's an open question. I don't have answers so nice, so such a unification like we had before. But, and it gets really sketchy because basically we are in a situation in which people have ideas how to do this and they try and they invent a new algorithm, right? And then you ask, okay, these guys are doing this, these guys are doing this. How these things are related? Right? It creates a lot of, uh, let's say, theoretical problems that... Um, it's not easy to answer this question. How are these two, me are these two methods the same method? Just they look differently, or uh, how they differ? And when will, will will when will fail? One will fail, and the other won't, and, say, and things like that. So these are hard questions, but very valuable questions because it provides all the things we have seen for the linear thing. I'm gonna sketch up one of the most po many of the methods for nonlinear systems kind of have this flavor. So now your constraints, instead of being just the linear operator, see this R I put before, you may have a linear differential operator part, but now you have a nonlinear function on top of that. So the nonlinear differential operator most of the time is look at has a linear differential equation plus some nonlinear functions. Okay, so it's a non-homogeneous, if you want, a linear differential equation. And what people do is say, okay, we cannot find a solution for X because most of these problems don't have analytical solution. We cannot use the tricks we use to create the equivalence between regularized regression and Gaussian processes because we need this idea of green function and we need this idea of a joint that doesn't exist for these guys. Um, so we cannot do any of the tricks we had before. But we can do is let's find a surrogate for X for this solution that almost solves the dynamics, right? It's almost a solution of this problem. And the variety of method goes in how, how you find this surrogate, okay? So functional data analysis, if you go ram some way, this will be a spline on your data, a smoothing or spline of your data. 
Uh, but again, here it gets really hectic, like people will do whatever they think is the best. One method that is still not completely justifiable, but uh, still methodical, let's say it sticks to the idea that we want to use the information here, is they say, okay, this linear operator, I can actually find the green function. So if I put this guy here, I will think for a moment that the solution at time, oh, here, this should be a subindex, sorry, here. So the next surrogate, the next candidate as uh, x, is the linear operator using the nonlinear part evaluated on my previous surrogate. Right? So this is, I find iteratively always a, a linear, I solve a linear problem here all the time, but the sources for that linear problem is my previous guess. If you state it like this, and then you compare to all the things we have seen before, what you get here is nested Gaussian process, okay? Here, you guy. So this will be like deep Gaussian processes. This is what this guy is saying here. And um, and then at the end, basically, you're, um, you may end up with a full set of uh, these guesses. You know, you may be doing several guesses, different guesses by varying the theta, or, you know, you may have different guesses at each step. So the solution to this may not be unique. So you're going to mix them uh, in some way. This is really the structure. Of, I would call it 90% of the algorithms I've read to try to do inf effective inference with a um, nonlinear differential constraints or regularization terms. And I close it here. Uh, sorry for the last part, but it's really sketchy. I could go longer there, but I think maybe we can discuss it one to one uh, based on your interest. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I think I completely overdone it, right? I, I missed. Maybe one hour and ten minutes, did or something. No, oh. it's fifty-five. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes. So we have a couple of minutes for questions before we have everybody has to run before five o'clock. But uh, are there any questions? That's very bad. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's very uh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, beyond the problem, you should exactly on the day-to-day basis, which I'm not sure exactly which uh, data sets or uh, scenarios are. Yes. Because yes. About the yes. Basis. So, it, yeah, I definitely have relevance because I do this on the everyday basis. So, take the decision which model I will use or which algorithms I will use. And uh, the first question is: Is your database already given, or it can grow at your desire? So, if your data set is given, well, is the sparse data set or is it a very dense data set? Right? If it's dense, come and filter because we cannot do Gaussian process. And if it's not, if it's sparse, Gaussian process because, you know, it, the knobs are global and not iterative. So it's, understanding is easier there. Um, but also the type of uh, prior information. If your prior information data set is actually like a differential, linear differential equation like the one we saw there, then common fit is super natural to implement and super easy to implement. Um, but again, you will pay the price if it's a sparse, uh, if it's a sparse data set, you know, you will be iterating a lot the update state to get from one point to the other. Well, the Gaussian process, because you see global information, will do it uh, on one shot, but yeah, it's... Um, so what I'm saying is like, if your internal state is very big, there is this little n cube price the common filter will pay. If you do that, need to do this many, many, many times, maybe Gaussian process is just faster. Uh, even though this guy is linear, right? but the coefficients matter at that point. And the other rule is if the data set is dynamic, so you can grow it because, for example, it's a situation in which you have a simulator, the same question, like how expensive is to add one point to the data set? If it's not expensive and your prior is a linear differential equations, then yes, common filter is a very natural way of doing it. And it's a, the regular engineer will know how to do this. So it, it will be easily accepted as a solution. Um, but if you have more sparse things, or if you, you know what's the topology of your input space, then I, w I would choose a Gaussian process for that. Uh, but again, once I've chose my favorite Gaussian process, I can go to Simon Sarka and say, okay, tell me what's the, Gaussian, the common filter I'm proposing here, and he will give it to me, and then I will just choose a... But yeah, if I'm not going to exploit the equivalence, 
is sparseness of the data set. Yeah. Um, that means you need to know the topology of your input space, which you don't actually know. I mean, it's not so easy to know. Uh, are you filling your input space or not? I mean, you can always start with a cube, but maybe you have more information about it. Yeah. Somewhere maybe there. Can take another one. Yeah, uh, we of course. Yeah. Uh, I cannot see that, uh, no, because it's not because of the nonlinearity. So the nonlinearity here immediately tells you like there is no Gaussian process here anymore because um, if you put a noise, the nonlinear part will transform it into a non-Gaussian thing, and then bye bye Gaussian process, right? So um, if you think it in a iterative in a iterative way. But the methods, so they, they, people come to this idea, look, we cannot solve for x. So we're going to have an expression that quickly gives us a solution for what x is. So we're going to find a surrogate for it. We're going to approximate it with something that we can control better. It could be a parametric approximation, spline models of your data, right? Or it could be a Gaussian process approximation of your data, right? It's a non-parametric description of, of this function t there. So let's say you take a first case or a few, few samples and then you use a Gaussian process to um, solve for x. So x approximates the data you have, or let's say phi approximates the data you have, and then you penalize with this thing. So it's a very expensive step there to get the first guess. <clears throat> but now you got the first guess, and now you're going to continue in a different way. You're going to say, look, this phi zero, I'm going to put this here. I'm going to do it very quickly. I'm, I'm almost done here. 